pets? No, I mean, we all have animals, and um, no, he's never been mean any animal. And then there's younger siblings, so he's got a little sister. Yeah. Who, How did he interact with her? Um, well, they, they were very close, especially his little sister. They always played around. He was real close to her, and she still asks us for him all the time, and, uh, and she still doesn't know what's going on, and she wonders why she can't see her brother. So, but they miss him very much, and I think I'm pretty much the voice for the family, and I know I'm probably the first that y'all have seen, and I want to throw darts at me, but I mean, I'm sorry, I don't, you know, we have a good family, very good Christian family, and we're loving people, and we just don't know what happened. I think we're all trying to wonder what happened. Now, you've seen the, the newsreels with Aiden in the car. Again, is that the boy you knew? No, when I've seen that with him in there, uh, it's like he was on something. I could tell you just know because you're around him all the time. And I, he just looked like he was high on some kind of drugs. And I, I don't know, it wasn't the same person that I know and see every day. So, I mean. How has um, how has Aiden's arrest affected your family? Well, we haven't had a family event since. You know, no you relevance to any of the factors. Overall, um, we're sad all the time. You know, I mean, this is something you don't plan for. You just it happens, and you just you just don't know why, and you just. I pray every day for both families, and I try to stay strong for my children and my grandchildren because I'm pretty much been their mother, their father, and their grandmother and grandfather. And uh, we just, uh, she always cries, my daughter always cries. And then I cry, and they all cry, and you know. So I just wish I could have changed how things might have happened if I could have been there, you know. And what would you like to say to the court? Um, first I want to say to the family, I'm so sorry. I wish I could change what happened. And um, we pray for you every day. I pray for you every day. I pray for my family every day. And um, I just find, hope that you find peace somewhere. And, and uh, just know that he has a good family and we miss him. And we lost a child too, you know. He's, he's, I know there's not physically here, but he's here and I just, we just miss him. And, which just didn't happen, I don't know, you know. I had word, I had a letter ready, because you know, I knew I wouldn't speak right when I got up here and I could just leave the letters and, or I can read the letters or, you know. You want me to try to read the letters? Go ahead. Okay. I had, I had to plan in my mind what I would say, but when you get up here and you're so overwhelmed, you just don't know what to say because it's just a very tragic situation, you know? It's just tragic. Um, do you, you want me to read these? Okay. Um, and this is to the family for me. I just wanted to tell you, you um, that I'm feeling very deep sadness for the loss of your beautiful daughter and and I know the heartache you must be going through is just terrible and I will pray for you every day I promise and I just hope you find peace you know sometime you know closure for what happened um, um I love for you your honor I can't see her again. I'm sorry. I'm probably with a mess. I just wanted to tell you, um, I know he has to be punished and um, for his actions. And I love him and his family love him very much too. And I, I know we're a very large Christian family and uh, we pray all the time. And I just hope you consider it a little bit and please don't take him out of our lives forever. Uh, I know that I've died and not be able to spend time with him sometime before I go. I don't know. 
I am not good at this. I'm so sorry. Yeah. I know there's some good in Aiden. I don't know what happened to him that that this caused, but I know there's some good in him. And uh, and I think if we find that out, what caused him to do this, you know, and maybe we'll have more understanding of what happened. I don't know. I can't. I can't think. I just can't think. Sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry. No further questions, Your Honor. I'm sorry. So sorry. I'm not sure. Your grandson by your daughter. Yes. Okay. And how many children does she have? She has five. Okay. And where is Aiden in that group of five children? Uh, he's in the middle. Now, did the five kids? All kids. Yeah. I've never seen any fighting or arguing or any problem. Um, no, he's never been mean to any animal. And then there's younger siblings. So he's got a little sister. Yeah. Who, how did he interact with her? Um, well, they, they were very close, especially his little sister. They always played around. He was real close to her, and she still asks us for him all the time. And, uh, and she still doesn't know what's going on, and she wonders why she can't see her brother. So, but they miss him very much. And I think I'm pretty much the voice for the family, and I know I'm probably the first that y'all have seen, and probably want to throw darts at me, but I mean, I'm sorry. I don't, you know, we have a good family. Very good Christian family, and we're loving people, and we just don't know what happened. I think we're all trying to wonder what happened. Now, you've seen the the news reels with Aiden in the car again. Is that the boy you knew? No, when I seen that with him in there, uh, it's like he was. this program for a breaking news alert from the local station. You saw it happen just about an hour ago. A St. John's County judge ruled 16-year-old Aiden Fucci should spend his life in prison. The judge made that announcement shortly after 9 o'clock this morning. He said despite the fact that the 14-year-old, he was 14 at the time, Aiden Fucci's brain was not developed enough to have the maturity of an adult. He says the teen knew exactly what he was doing when he lured 13-year-old Tristan Bailey into a secluded yeah, 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 area and killed her. Let's listen in now to the and state attorney. To what was said in there, know how difficult that was for the family. I mean, try to imagine what it would be like for you, for it be your family, and you're there listening to what that judge was saying about what happened to your family member, your daughter, your brother, your sister, your niece, your granddaughter. You know, the system is not kind to victims and their families. The process demands, as the judge said, constitutional rights and constitutional mandates, but sometimes the victims and their families get lost in that shuffle. But not here, and not today, and not in St. John's County. I can tell you that having met the, the Bailey family, and I haven't spent as much time with them as Jennifer Dutton has, the, the lead prosecutor in this case, but I can tell you that I am a much better man and a much better prosecutor having met them. I just only hope that should I be faced with the tremendous, the tremendous trauma and grief of going through a loss like they did, that I could handle it with the dignity and grace that they have to this point. And again, let me remind you, try to put yourself in their shoes and how difficult this whole process has been. 22 months of, of court proceedings, 22 months of media coverage, and I'm not pointing fingers or blaming the media. We understand that this is a story that needs to be covered, but please try to be empathetic to these folks as we go through this process today. Now, I'm going to call Mr. Forrest Bailey up to speak. The Bailey family will not be taking questions. Mr. Bailey is going to read a statement to you. At this time, I would ask Forrest if he would please come up. Roger, thank you. Yes, sir. Good morning. My name is Forrest Bailey, and I am Tristan Tyne's father, and I will be speaking on behalf of my family. 
To start with, I would first like to thank God for the strength he has given us since Tristan was taken from us, the grace he has instilled within us to support each other as we grieve, and especially for the incredible love that we have seen from so many in the world. I would like to thank the Honorable Judge Smith for his consideration in deciding upon the life sentence verdict. While it can seem so easy to many people for this to be the verdict, it must be an extremely difficult determination for the judge to arrive at, given all the aspects he needs to consider. We are very appreciative of this outcome and feel that it is the right verdict, considering how heinous the crime is and Aiden's behaviors around it. In one of our initial meetings with R.J. Larissa from the state attorney office, we gave our word that we would wait until the criminal proceedings were complete so that we did not distract from justice being served. It is important that the case is tried in the court of law. In agreement with them, we do have a few brief words to say today. However, we will not be very expansive as there is still an open case with Crystal Smith. During her celebration of life, we shared that we, to continue Tristan's fight, we are gonna fight for justice. Truth be told, this fight was done by so many, and the outcome today is a result of their efforts. Before we get into some of those thanks, as a parent, foremost, I would like to caution both parents and children on the dangers of social media and technology. As has come out through the proceedings, Aiden Fucci did not even have Tristan's contact information until the evening before he killed her. While we have gone to a point where children are carrying technology for convenience and safety to contact their parents and their friends when needed, it comes at a great risk. It likely would not have made a difference in Tristan's case as it was referred from a trusted friend and she also knew Aiden from school. However, we would be sick to have it happen to any other family by not raising our concerns and our cautions. Please, to all the kids, if your parents require you to turn in your cell phones, realize your phone is a privilege, not a right, and that they are demonstrating love and protection for you. Parents, I encourage you to do so. As part of this investigation, the amount of kids sneaking out in our community and the frequency of how often they are doing so had us completely dumbfounded. On a different note, during Wednesday's proceedings and the filings at the end of the day, there were several apologies given from Aiden and some members of Aiden's family. Foremost to his grandmother, your apology on the stand really touched us it was the first time anyone in your family had acknowledged it, and we feel for you as we could tell how much you are hurting. With respect to the apology letter from Aiden, from his behavior at court, at no point has his actions fell in line with the letter, and I believe it is due to the coaching from the defense. With respect to the legal process that takes time, and to the comment from the defense about us not accepting the apology, I find that hard to stomach. The defense was insensitive to my family when they called out in writing our participations in these proceedings, which are our right to do so. They mentioned it in filings. They even went further by sending out a survey to my wife asking her opinion on aiding murdering Tristan. At no point did they have the common decency to give an apology, so I think they should reconsider their high ground before they advise anyone else on apologies. With regard to Crystal Smith and her apology, as I mentioned before, there's an open case with her, so it's difficult to comment. The fact that we are continuing to have to go through the legal process makes the apology questionable. You've seen the videos from the home. You've seen the videos from the interrogation room. I would say if she's sorry, she can start by accepting responsibility. To Aiden's family, I would remind them that he is still here. They can still see him. They can encourage him to change his behavior, 
of bragging about his brutality and threatening the corrections officers and their families that keep him from harm and setting out on a better road. To those around his extended family, please extend them kindness. They should be given grace for the pain they are going through. They should not be given additional hardship. Tristan had a good friend amongst his extended family and treating them poorly based on Aiden's crime does not honor her memory or her spirit. At this point, I would like to transition and thank a number of parties which are typically either overlooked or not thanked. As a start, I would like to first thank our local Jacksonville-based media. Over time, we realized that the facts around this case made it one that was of great public interest. It happened in the well-recognized family county of St. John's. It was a vicious murder by a 14-year-old of a 13-year-old, and it happened on Mother's Day. An absolute lightning rod. Along the way, you have requested our respect for privacy, as well as our intent to wait until these proceedings are complete before sharing our thoughts. I think what is very important, as we saw respectful communication in the coverage and how things are dealt. For example, as a victim's family, I hate seeing the picture of my beautiful daughter next to the person responsible for her murder. I think that's true for most victims' families. When we express this and our outrage and the hurt it caused, we saw a change over time, both in the broadcast as well as the articles, and we appreciate those efforts. While likely also driven through the incredible compassion and love demonstrated from the St. John's community, we also saw a focus of the victim and highlights of Tristan's life and what she did. This is, imp this is important. It shouldn't just be about the details of their death. I would suggest there needs to be more focus put on the victims of other crimes and not just these lightning cases. For example, there was a recent murder in Putnam County of Ayanna Belton, which was similar in brutality, and yet not enough highlighted on that family and her loss. Also like to say a very quick word with respect to some of the most social media stories, the podcasts, the channels. More and more people are turning to these channels to get information. It is my hope, honestly, for people to do better and to be more sensitive. For anyone that tunes to these channels, please realize that there are subscribers and web clicks, and you may approximate that to ratings for established news media. Yet this is not reflective of the integrity of the information that you are consuming. Over the course of the past almost two years, we had several people send us links from programs. Many of them were downright nauseating. They were inaccurate. They were over-dramatization. Truly, it's hurtful to the victims' families. They're profiting from this. However, there were some that were very truthful, some that had done some research, and there were some that were out there that were trying to do a good job. How you tell the difference between them is not clear. So again, I would caution people as to where they get their information. My intent here, though, is not to criti criticize but encourage people to do better. I would even give a recent example as there was a Twitter account that posted information that was very unnecessary and hurtful. When a good family friend reached out to them to explain this, they connected, connected that this was a real person with people still grieving for her loss. They then took it down. They stated an apology from what they learned from it. I have no idea who sits behind the keyboard of at docket, and it's unlikely that I never meet the individual. Yet the way he handled the mistake speaks well to the, in his integrity, and it gives me hope that this will improve in time. Sticking with the theme of appreciating pe people that do not get enough. 
I have to thank the Seventh Circuit State Attorney's Office. Many of us understand the importance of having great leadership at the top, and I absolutely have to say this is the case with respect to R.J. Larissa. From the initial conversation we had with him around the grand jury until meeting with him recently, preparing to go to trial, we know he has been focused on getting justice and doing so in a compassionate way. I am deeply grateful for the work he's continuing to do. RJ, thank you. To the state attorney prosecution team of Jennifer Dutton and Mark Johnson, while we understand that you work for the state of Florida, we could not have wished for two better people to prosecute this case. Along the way, the care and compassion and understanding that you showed to my family was exemplary. You made it very easy to have faith that you would get justice. In addition to you, we also want to thank your families. We know that there is a tremendous amount of sacrifices made by them to make sure that you could prosecute this to the fullest extent. And they made, they had a lot of disruptions and we appreciate it. There were many times that you had to prepare us for the very worst leading up to February 6th when we expected to go to trial. We know you wanted to make sure we were prepared for the facts and details. The compassionate way in which you made sure we were prepared for things as horrific as the crime scene photos and the medical examiner's report speaks volumes to the incredible people you are at your core. I cannot fathom how you do the job that you do, and I'm very grateful that you represent the people in the 7th Judicial Circuit and on our case. Jenny, Mark, from the bottom of our heart. Thank you. We are also well aware that the entire staff of the 7th Circuit State Attorney's Office helped either directly or indirectly on this case. Again, we're incredibly thankful to you and all the sacrifices that you made and the support you received from your families. We would be very remiss in not calling out one specific individual who has been a wonderful point of contact throughout. Terry Sims. You were the first person that I spoke with. You've been a contact throughout and you've really touched our heart. When we learned that you delayed your retirement from November when the trial date moved because you wanted to see this case through, it was a tremendous reflection of the entire office. Thank you so much for everything you did for us. And thank you for so much for everything that you've done for our justice system in our over 30 years. Thank you. It's impossible to talk about the seven state attorney's office without also mentioning the St. John's Sheriff's Office. Again, much of this starts with the leadership at the very top. Years ago, when he was at the start of his law enforcement career, Sheriff Hardwick worked on the Haley Cummings case. Sheriff Hardwick applied everything he learned from that case to Tristan's. Our county is extremely fortunate to have Sheriff Hardwick at the helm as we continue to grow in St. John's. He and Kendall are tireless in their efforts to engage with the community and the work he does in the background to support everyone in the SJSO is unseen to the public, yet so appreciated and felt by the people in his department. Servant, servant leadership and leading from the front at its best. Support from the St. John Sheriff's Office truly began prior to us ever needing to call. He and his team have developed entity. The youth resource officers who mean so much to the students within the schools they are in. For us, this was Deputy Beasley. When the 911 call was made and the social media information started coming in, as Stacy mentioned, Deputy Beasley was integral in starting to help the investigative crew make some connections. With respect to that investigation, investigative crew, 
the thoroughness and attentiveness of their work clearly came through on Tuesday. This was both with the original patrol and especially with respect to Sergeant Kurt Hannon. I have thanked Sergeant Hannon and so many times and will never be able to thank him enough. Everything he did to coordinate the work of a massive team and also to get the information that came from the community. While it was incredibly difficult news to hear, the fact that he showed up at our door at 3.40 in the morning to let us know they had her killer meant the world. We know there are so many contributed to the case throughout this time and even recently. Again, on behalf of my family, we appreciate each and every one of you and also give our heartfelt thanks to your respective families who support the incredible work you do. There is also a very special group of people I'd like to recognize in the bailiffs that work here at the courthouse and are in, are in the courtyard with us today. These people are simply incredible at what they do. I was able to sit in a room with a known killer of one of my family members and have no concern for the safety of the rest of my family. In every interaction, they were also so understanding and supportive. Truly just an amazing group of people. There are a few people I would like to call out individually to thank. First off, I have to thank Bob Ellis. He's been a wonderful and true friend. He helped me in so many ways and I'm extremely grateful for it. I also need to thank Matthew H. Henson. My family has known and worked with Matt for several years and I was so thankful when he offered to help us coordinate all the media requests. He did so much more than that. There are so many times he has also been a venting and guidance outlet to our, our family and particularly me. Matt, thank you. To the counseling community that has helped my family throughout this, I'm very appreciative. In particular, Megan Logan and Kaylee Brennan. This grieving process is hard and without the additional focus that we have had, we would not stand as strong if it weren't for your respective help. Ashley Mitchell. We would be here for hours to talk about everything that you have done for the different members of our family as our victim's advocate. Your network was invaluable in helping us to find counseling resources we needed. You were always extremely adept at following up on every initial rumor or concern that made its way to us in the early days and very knowledgeable about explaining and setting our expectations for what is to come in the legal process. I've been truly amazed at how you have learned Bailey time. <laughs> <laughs> you seem to always communicate the right time for us to be here so that we could get through security and not delay the, the court proceedings. Ashley, in the wide expanse of people that our family knows, no one have a, has ever done this as well as you have. From the bottom of our heart, thank you. In the days ahead, we're going to shift our focus and talk more about Tristan, the plans that we have to celebrate her legacy. And we have a tremendous amount to share about this St. John's community the people in it, the businesses that have supported us, the cheer community, and everything that they've done. As I look over, I also see all of our friends and family, and it's just a small sample of who could be here today. You've helped carry us throughout, and we appreciate and love each and every one of you. Today is about focusing on the people who helped deliver justice for our community. And I want to keep the focus on that. Before I close, though, I would like to say a few words into the universe. God, I know you're always listening when we talk to you. 
and would ask your assistance to get Tristan's attention for a moment as she probably started doing something more fun as I was going along. Tristan, I wanted to let you know we are so extremely proud of the person that you were in your time here. We have seen that when you went out into the world, you gave it your very best. You should be proud of the friend that you were, the teammate you were, and what you left behind and the people that knew you that we trust will go forward and continue to make the world a better place. With respect to what you mean to our family, it's in our hearts, there are no words. We love you, we will continue to hold you in our hearts, and we will always be the Bailey Seven. At this time, it's my pleasure to hand it over to Sheriff Rob Hardwick. I wish I actually would have uh, spoke before you forced. I'm not sure how you follow that besides putting an exclamation point uh, behind that statement that he gave on behalf of the Bailey family. I will tell you this, Mother's Day of 2021, the St. John's County Sheriff's Office got the privilege to meet the Bailey Seven. We wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for that horrific incident. With that being said, what happened was a team came together from the St. John's County Sheriff's Office, the Seventh Judicial Circuit State Attorney's Office, and today we finished what we started together with the Bailey Seven. We could not ask for a better family to be a victim in this process. Patient, respectful, understanding, and truly finished it to the end together with our team. We, together with the St. John's County Sheriff's Office, you're no longer the Bailey 7, you're the Bailey 927 is what you are. With that being said, I do want to recognize two people that Forrest actually mentioned that are right to my left to your right. And that's Sergeant Kurt Hannon, who was the lead investigator from the start. And then our lead victim advocate, Ashley Mitchell, who was also introduced here a minute ago. The entire team at the St. John's County Sheriff's Office, it takes a true team to work these type of cases. And we did it together. However, these two individuals started it and finished it with this family by their side, 24 hours a day. And again, they are part of that Bailey family now. I do want to recognize the prosecutors in this case, Jenny Dutton and Mark Johnson. RJ, as you know, I had the privilege of working with both of those when I worked for the state attorney's office. You want to talk about the epitome of prosecutors with preparing a case from start to finish. Those are the two that actually know how to do it right. By the way, they were prepared for trial and they were prepared to win in trial all the way to the day today when he was actually sentenced. With that being said, on behalf of the St. John's County Sheriff's Office, the entire team that put this case together with R.J. Larita, Larissa, I'm sorry, and his entire state attorney's office team, thank you to the Bailey family for understanding of what this job entails. Again, we will forever. Be a part of the. Bailey, 927. Thank you. I wish you could walk behind me. As I said when we started this, this is reality. This is the true nitty gritty of what happens when we have violence in our communities and the impact that it takes, not just on the family, but the community. And again, I urge and challenge all of you in the uh, media to respect that and to recognize that as you cover stories. And unfortunately, there'll probably be more stories uh, that you will cover that will have the impact of what we've had today. It's a sad reality of the world in which we live. Having said that, I'd just like to also recognize Jenny Dutton and Mark Johnson. You don't understand the toll it takes on prosecutors as well to, to immerse themselves in cases like this over and over again. With families to take care of, they, they come in and work nights and weekends and holidays to make it happen. And 
I truly appreciate and respect that. Now, if you have any questions, again, the Bailey family is not taking questions. But if you have questions, we will entertain them at this time. Okay. Attorney, listening to you, listening to Chair Hardwick, it's clearly personal. How do you try a case, make sure that you do everything, check off all the boxes legally when you're looking at a 13-year-old girl who lost her life, her family dealing with so much pain? How do you separate that and still show compassion? Well, I'm not sure that you separate it. You become a part of it. The, the truly great prosecutors, the great investigators, they you have to become a part of it. That's why it takes such a toll. And that's why I'm saying think about what it does to the families and think about what it does to the folks that are involved. We have to dive in and deal with it and show the families that we care and that we're going to do something about it. That's how we deal with it. What changes do you think? State Attorney R.J. Larizza. You know, when we heard the judge hand down sentence, he said one of the factors in deciding whether or not he was going to give Aiden Fucci 40 years behind bars or life in prison was the impact on the community. You saw here how it impacted a community. I know Sheriff Hardwick, we know Rob, and he is a hardened police officer and you saw the emotion there. Let's revisit the time in the courtroom when the sheriff handed down sentence. All right, uh, it is on newsforjacks.com. Jen, it was emotional in the courtroom. It was emotional here. One of the things that the judge said was that it is going to be difficult for the Bailey family to heal. But you heard Forrest Bailey talk about the fact that they want to celebrate Tristan. Yeah. They want to talk about the happiness that she brought and, and the laughter that she can still bring to the family. And that's going to be, as you heard from Forrest, uh, that's going to be the focus now. Not just on his family and healing his family, as the judge, ha judge has suggested. This is not closure for this family. This family is going to continue to struggle. And quite frankly, they have leaned on their family, they've leaned on their friends, and they've leaned on the St. John's County community. And uh, they are forever grateful, as you heard Tristan's father say, specifically the incredible love that we have seen we appreciate so much, not just from the community, but from around the world. And, and before we leave you, I, I think it's important that Jen and I, not as news people, but we talk to you as parents, because we, we both have kids. And um, Forrest Bailey said, you know, as a parent, when it comes to access to cell phones and social media, we're not preaching to you here. Be mindful of, of what your kids are doing, because Cell phone access, social media access played a role in what happened between Aiden Fucci and Tristan Bailey. And that's something that we'll be talking about in the days and weeks to come. I, I think what Mr. Bailey said was that the dangers of social media are very real and your kids need to know that having a phone is a privilege. Yeah. It is not a right. To continue to have that open line of communication with your teenagers, even when they don't always want to talk to you.